weeks. There's a time to love and a time to hate and a time of war and a time of peace. I pray today that God gives me the ability to, to preach His truth and preach it well. But it's going to be to none avail unless there's good and honest hearts. The seed of the Word is not going to do anything unless it has good ground, which is why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the preaching, the Holy Spirit in the hearing. You've got to be honest. The prodigal came to himself. It means for the first time he was honest with himself. The plastic fell off. The Bible says they counted the law of God a strange thing. They will not endure sound doctrine in the last days. The Bible says unless you grow up and think with a mature mind, God won't teach you. So let's pray. Dear Father, I do ask, please, Lord, there may be teenagers somewhere that are being forced by parents, and that's a good thing to hear the message today, God. Maybe their heart is not right. Maybe they're tempted with rebellion, Lord. Out there somewhere, sometime, somebody may hear this message, Lord. And Father, I do pray that you will cause their hard heart to melt, God. Lord, let them reason today, Father. Break down the devices of the enemy that's put up all these roadblocks in their mind to keep them from understanding. And we'll thank you for it, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. I'm going to preach to you today about feminism makes women sad. No peace for Jezebel. I did not intend to preach this message today, but as I began to dig into my message, I noticed how it jumped out. It just jumped out of the Word of God, and, and I began to see that this is what I need to speak upon today. Uh, feminism makes women sad. That's my point today. There is no peace for Jezebel. Never has been, never will be. Young people need to know this. Everybody needs to know this. Now when I say feminism makes women sad, it makes children sad. It makes men sad. But one thing they're not telling you is it, no, 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 no I take that back. This is everywhere. I, I, I'm not even going to use... I, I could quote fundamentalists from the 1920s that were warning against feminism. I, I, I could quote so many fundamentalists down through the ages that warned what's coming to this nation. I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, I, I'm going to quote worldly people. And people say, why do you do that? Why, why do you quote the liberals? Why do you quote the world? Well... I want to show you that they are admitting what the fundamentalists have always known. Wow. God help us again today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, I want you to notice. There is a time of peace. We've been preaching about a time of war. And you are at war right now with the devil. You are at war with the lust of the flesh that war against your soul. You are at war. Do not forget it. But there is a time of peace. And I want to preach on that today. Uh, because if you get this time of peace wrong, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. If you make peace with the wrong side and the wrong spirit, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So what about this thing called peace? We need peace with God, don't we? We need peace with God for all eternity. And praise the Lord, it says in Romans 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the peacemaker. He was the peace offering, the sin offering. He came to bring peace between God and man. 
And all this is right now is a temporary reprieve. He's going to come and claim what is his and take control and throw the devil in hell. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under our feet shortly. Now listen. Right now he's offering peace to all that will accept his mercy. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved in thy house. So we have peace for all eternity by believing in the Lord Jesus, his death upon the cross for us. By grace are we saved through faith. Now hold on a second. After you have peace with God for all eternity, you become a child of God. Then you need to walk in peace. You need to experience that peace with God. Uh, in a nutshell, you need to have peace with God during the millennial kingdom. That comes through faith and patience. Faith and works. Grace through faith and works. A lot of people get that mixed up. They get the eternal peace mixed up with the daily fellowship and peace at the judgment seat of Christ. That comes by you obeying God. For it says in Romans 8, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Oh, you, you don't want the terror of the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. You want peace. You want peace with God. You've got to walk daily with your heavenly Father, putting away sin, denying yourself, growing in the truth and in grace. Now, when Cain disobeyed God, his countenance fell. He didn't have any peace. Now, you would think he would have had peace, right? Now, not as a mature believer. You know he's not going to have any peace. But I'm saying, from a worldly, the way that seems right unto a man, you would think he would have peace, that Abel would be the unhappy one, and that Cain would have peace. I mean, he went his own way. Nobody's going to tell him what to do. He's going to worship God in his own way. He, he's going to bring God his vegetables. Cain is the first example that doing your own thing does not bring peace. His countenance was fallen because he was not accepted by God. You need acceptance by God. And Paul says we all labor that we may be accepted of him. You say, I'm accepted in Jesus. Well, eternally you are if you're a believer. But I'm talking about accepted in regard to your walk not your position, in regard to your walk, in regard to your daily fellowship with God. People go in the way of Cain and they don't have any peace. We're going to invent a new thing. We're going to try a new experiment that's never been, well, it has been tried before, but in general, it's a new thing. The Gnostic Bibles, uh, uh, the Satanic counterfeit Gospel of Thomas and Gospel of Peter, the ancient Gnostic writings of the Nicolaitans and Gnostics, they said a day's going to come when the kingdom of God will be here when women renounce the dress of their sex and try to become men. Then you will have peace. Is that true, brother? Is that true? No. That is the fake peace that the Antichrist is going to bring to this earth. He's going to destroy many by peace. Speaking of this feminism, I want you to look at Numbers chapter 30. Take a look at it there for me now. It says, And her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul. And her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall, be, shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. And if she had all had a husband when she vowed, or uttered wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it. Then her vows shall stand, and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. 
according to God. You believe there's a God? I do. I believe there's a God. I believe God gave us His law, His will, His truth. And what God said, whether you like it or not, whether Jezebel likes it or not, what God said is a man's headship is so, uh, shall we say, uh, extensive, not in a sinful way, but he is able as a father or as a husband to disavow a vow that his wife made to God. Now, I do not believe any man has the right to make a woman sin, a daughter or a wife. I do not believe that you should sin because somebody tells you so, an earthly authority. But you better be very careful with this thing. She said, I vowed to God. See, see, see God's not going to put up with people. Even though he said, I do not want you, we ought to obey God rather than men. Don't you get rebellious and start walking in there and saying, well, God told me to do this. Or, or, or I have a vow with God and I'm going to keep that. No, you better watch that stuff. God says your husband or father can disavow your vow to God. But what I also want to show you is your peace. If the man hold his peace, boy, we see that phrase all throughout the Bible. What that means is if he just stays quiet. If he stays quiet, the vow will stand if he doesn't disavow it, if he holds his peace. Holding your peace means that you stay quiet. So we've already seen there's a time. Now, if y'all look like you're paying attention, I'm not going to jump around and scream. But if it looks like you're falling asleep and daydreaming, then i got to jump around like a baboon and keep you awake, okay? Now listen. There's a time to be silent and a time to speak. There's a time to hold your peace and a time to not hold your peace. If there's a time of war and a time of peace, there's a time to not hold your peace. We better get this thing straight. We better get it straight. Look at Esther chapter 4. She thought it was a time to hold her peace. They were going to kill the Jews. She says, I can't go in there. I can't just go appear before the king. I'm not going to risk my life. I've got too much stuff going on in the palace. I can't just go marching into the king and do all this stuff. All of that that's going on outside the palace and everything, you've got to look to it, uh, Uncle Mordecai. I can't take care of that. Oh, what did he say? What did he say? Chapter 4, If thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then there shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? What he's saying is, Esther, if you don't want to stand up and do what's right, if you hold your peace in this situation, God will bring deliverance. I have faith in God, but he's going to curse you. He's going to curse you. Because you did not stand up and do what you could have done in this situation. There might be a lot of destruction going on around you people, and God's going to ask, what could you have done? You say, it's not my business. Oh, it is your business. What could you have done to not enable the destruction all around you? He expected Esther to stand up and do what's right, and she thought she was just put there because she's gorgeous. Hey, folks. God had Esther there, not only because she's pretty and gorgeous and sweet, he had Esther there for a reason, to save the Jews. So don't look at your life and say, by my own hand, I'm where I'm at. No, God has you where you're at to help promote his kingdom and his truth and his righteousness and to stop evil and hinder evil as much as we can until he takes us out of here. Now, every believer who's ever tried to stand up has been tempted to hold their peace. You know why? Because things don't go good for you, uh, earthly-wise, when you begin to speak, when you stand up. Sometimes you get persecuted. Sometimes family members persecute you. Notice Psalms 39, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. But you know what? A godly believer, it's hard for him to live like that. You might say, I'm going to be a quiet believer. I'm going to be a cool Christian. I'll never say what needs to be said. 
and stand for what's right because then nobody will like me. And so I'm going to be a Christian that everybody likes. Praise God, the Holy Spirit, when it gets grieved inside of you. Praise God, unless you've totally numbed your conscience and seared it with a hot iron, I tell you what, it's going to be hard to live like that. And so he says, my heart, my, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. Hey, you could read about Jeremiah doing the same thing. It began to get hot inside. That fire began to burn inside of him. He says, I'm not going to speak. My family's mad at me. Everybody's mad. I'm not going to speak. And it began to burn inside of him. I hope you've got some fire in you. I hope you have some zeal. And I hope you understand I can't be quiet. I will not sit down. I will not be quiet. I don't want to speak like a fool or speak at the wrong time. But I'm going to stand up and say what needs to be said. I can't be quiet. And I hope you're like that. Now, it doesn't mean that you want to be a troublemaker. They accused Elijah of being a troublemaker. I wear it as a badge that they called me the most obnoxious, the most obnoxious preacher in North Texas. I wear it as a badge of honor. Because you've got to look at who's calling me obnoxious. Who called Elijah a troublemaker? But it doesn't mean that we're purposely trying to create hardship for people. We're trying to help people. It says in Psalms 120, I am for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. In other words, when you try to tell at a sodomite parade, you try to say to those little kids, this isn't right. It's because you're for peace. You want them to have peace with God. You want your city to have peace with God. You don't want people to die of horrible diseases and then go to hell. You want them to have peace with God. This doesn't bring peace. Sin doesn't bring peace. Abominations didn't bring peace to Sodom. Abominations didn't bring peace to Corinth. It didn't bring peace to any of these other cities that were destroyed by lava, that were wicked. But when you go to try to help people, they will persecute you. Therefore, war. Who made you a judge over me? And therefore, war, they will hate you. In fact, they will begin to plot how to destroy you because you preached against them. You reproved them and they will hate you and persecute you. Therefore, war. Isaiah 62, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Praise God for the watchmen that God raises up. And they're not going to be quiet. You're not going to shut them up. And if you ever do kill them and God allows it, He'll raise up another one. Amen? You're not going to get away from God. They're not going to hold their peace. There's a time for peace, but not while destruction and hell are taking over everybody. There's no time to hold your peace. There's no time to be a fluffy, sissy Christian. It's time to stand up and be strong. Contend with the wicked. 2 Kings 7, there were some lepers. And everybody was starving. And they came into a camp and they found all kinds of riches and food and spoil. So they decided we're going to hold a party and just enjoy it. That's what a lot of Christians do. A lot of Christians have peace with God. And you know what? They think they can sit down and just take the truths that God's given them and just sit over here and have them a little fellowship with donuts and everything and everything's going to be all right. God didn't give you truth to simply enjoy yourself. So these lepers had enough sense. They had more sense than many Christians today. They said one to another, we do not well this day. This day is the day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Praise God for that. The king has a household. Amen. There's believers that need to know about the judgment seat of Christ. They don't know about it. They've been lied to. I tell you what, the king's household needs to know about the hope of the kingdom. They need to know about the riches of reigning with the Lord. They need to know about the peace and blessings that can come and this hope of the kingdom. But if you tarry till morning light, if you hold your peace, 
till the day dawns, which is the coming of the Lord Jesus, what does he say? If the watchman on the wall doesn't tell them, their blood I will require at your hand. And you see, when you bring back God what he gave you, he says, why did you think I gave it to you? I didn't, I didn't give it to you to give back to me what I gave you. I wanted you to go get interest. I wanted you to go get a return on what I gave you. Whatever I tell you in secret, shout upon the housetop. Don't hide it under your bed. No, truth is for the people that are perishing out here, saved and unsaved eternally or millennially or even in this life it's time to go help people with the truth that God has given you don't be a chicken don't be a crybaby get out there you say well it's dangerous well love the Lord don't be afraid of man be afraid of God who can destroy both soul and body in hell these lepers said some curse is gonna come upon us if we're quiet some curse is gonna come upon you if you're quiet hey man it's the truth God help us now moving along we're going to get into the point today. There is a bidding of Godspeed to the world. There is a worldly help and encouragement of the backslidden that we've been talking about, that we've seen, that will make you a partaker of their evil deeds. So what we're trying to say is there is a peace that you can give to others that may get you in a lot of trouble. You say, well, I'm trying to be a peacemaker. I'm trying to do what Jesus told me. Hey, the devil comes as an angel of light. He'll get you out here trying to spread peace, thinking you're doing the will of the Lord Jesus, and you're doing the will of the devil. Let me show you. 1 Kings 22. Jehoshaphat made what? What's our word? What's our word, So Peace. And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. Now, hold on a second. He did some good things. The remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father, Asa, he took out of the land. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Man, this fellow was so bold that he got rid of the remnant of the Sodomites. He's a pretty strong fella, a pretty bold fella. But he made peace with that wicked king of Israel. You got to turn to Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 19, to see a little more detail. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. So he made peace with that wicked king of Israel, and he returned to his house in peace. Oh, he's singing. He's singing the latest Christian song on the radio. He is just doing good. I mean, everything's going great. Uh-oh, and Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? And love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou takest away the groves out of the land. I mean, you got rid of those sodomites and those pagan, but you made friends with an evil king. Why did God get so angry? Why did God get angry? Because you know what he did? When he made a covenant and made peace with that backslidden king, and his wicked wife. What he did was confirm them in their sin. Do you understand that? He made them feel comfortable in their sin. God wanted them to repent. And maybe they would have to some degree. At least they have. I know he, 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 he almost repented or came close to it. Did in some degree. But I'm going to tell you something. When you keep God from working in people... Because you encourage them. I just read the other day somebody that was about to repent because the Holy Ghost was upon them. And I read their writings and it said, well, I'm getting so encouragement from my friends that I'm just going to resist. Obviously, this is the devil trying to tell me that I'm doing wrong. Thank you all for encouraging me. And I just look at that and said, that person would have repented. That person was close to repenting. Who was it that kept them from repenting? Encouragers. Encouragers. Wow. That man in Corinth didn't repent till the encouragers repented. You understand that? You encourage people to do the wrong thing. You are a sorry person. The Bible says you are a sodomite. Now look at 2 Kings 9. So there went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? 
And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. And that's something. When you're around certain people, they say, Is it peace? What did Jehu say? You don't even know peace. What, what have you got to do with peace? Your friends are Jezebel. What do you know about peace? So finally the king comes. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms. And the arrow went out at his heart and he sunk down in his chariot. As Poole tells us, What peace? What cause is thou to expect peace when thou hast so long uh, enabled and still does enable your mother and her abominable practices? Wow. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. And as Jehu entered into the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? What's Jezebel say? So remember when somebody conspired, God judged them. Don't you conspire against me. She doesn't realize. So, so she's blaming Jehu for, be, Jehu for being a rebel. And she says, you're being a rebel. No, 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 no. He's doing what God said, young man. He's doing what God said. God said, get out there and judge that wicked witch and make sure that you cleanse the land of her whoredoms and witchcrafts. And this, her son was enabling her witchcrafts, and he, should, he was the king. He should have known better. And I'm telling you something here. Jezebel. Jezebel. For thousands of years, Jezebel has been the model for a miserable, angry feminist. The Lord Jesus says... I have some things against you, talking to one pastor, because you tolerate a Jezebel among you. You tolerate her, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches my children things that lead to fornication. The Lord Jesus is angry with any pastor that tolerates Jezebel to mislead young people. Jezebel becomes the model for a miserable, angry feminist. What does she do? She surrounds herself with eunuchs. Weak men. She paints herself, literally and figuratively. What do we get out of that? Listen to me now. Listen to me. This is so important. It's so important that you realize this. I think any kid can sit down, any, any young girl can sit down with her mama and they can get on the internet and they say, Mama, let's look up some of these feminists in the 60s. Say, Mama, is that one of them right there? That's scary, Mama. Why is she so ugly and mean looking? Why is she so hideous looking? She doesn't look happy, Mama. Why are all these feminists so angry looking? Mama, let's type in the people that were against them. Wow, look at these women, Mama. They look very sweet and kind as they were standing against the feminists. But if you go to public school that's controlled by feminists, if you sit before Hollywood, which is controlled by feminists. They will paint a picture that's not reality. The picture they paint is that feminism makes you happy. So when Jezebel is painting her face, I want you to always think about that. A Jezebel will paint her face and pretend to be something she's not. She will put on a plastic face. 
I have heard some of the older sisters say, when they've seen a backslidden, a backslidden younger sister, they said, that plastic smile is not fooling me. That plastic face she has on, I can see. So, see, you can't fool some of these women that, that have been through some hard knocks and repented of it. They said, you can't fool me with that fake face. You're not fooling me. I can see what's behind the plastic. You might fool some of these teenage kids. You're not fooling me. Everything's going great. You can rebel and everything just goes so great for you. See how happy I am. They will play religion. They will use religion as a covering. The Bible says they will have a form of godliness. They're disobedient to fathers, but they're going to have a form of religion. They're disobedient to husbands, but they're going to have a form of religion. Look at Proverbs 7. The adulterous woman says, I have peace offerings with me. Peace offerings? This day I have paid my vows. You're not keeping your vow. <laughs> what are you doing? Why the religious covering? Well, of course she's saying, I have a lot of meat in my house. We can have a feast. But I think there's more to it than that. Because when you offered the peace offering, you was able to take back to your house some of the meat. So in one sense, she's telling him, hey, we got a lot to eat here. Let's have a feast and solace ourselves with loves. While the good man is away. She admits he's the good man. Geneva Notes from hundreds of years ago says harlots outwardly will seem holy and religious. Why do they do that? They're putting on a plastic face. Jezebel paints her face. So when you say so-and-so seems happy to me, sometimes you've got to look behind the plastic. Sometimes you've got to look behind all the makeup. And fake hair, fake hair dye, or fake coloring. Look at Ezra 9. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons. What do you mean give not your daughters? Give not your daughters? Of course, it says in 1 Corinthians 7 that a man has a right to give his daughter or not give her. Now any godly man is going to give his daughter to somebody she loves unless he's wicked. Or unless God says no. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, they were giving their daughters to heathens. Giving their sons, heathen daughters. And Ezra says, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. You say, well, we're not to destroy the Canaanites like they were in the Old Testament. Right, you're to go preach to them and try to get them saved, but does, does that mean God wants you to touch the unclean thing? Does that mean God wants you to be unequally yoked with them? When God says, I don't even want you sitting down and eating with folks unless they're repenting and seeking? Paul says you can't leave the world, but hey, if somebody professes to be a believer and they walk in these sins, such a one don't even eat with them. They don't have church and fellowship and make them feel secure in their sin. Now the Lord Jesus shows us how we are to interpret this in the New Testament. In Matthew 10, He says you're to go house to house. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And then he tells you, he that biddeth a false teacher, Godspeed, is partaker of his evil deeds. What do you, uh, many Christians today would say, I'm just going to bring my peace upon every single house. No, that's not what God said. Psalms 34. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good? God's going to give you the secret to being happy. Here's the secret. Verse 13. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Liars and hypocrites, 
deceivers with their mouth, they're not going to see good days. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. What does he mean, seek peace? Spurgeon says, peace with God, with thy own heart, and with thy fellow man. So many people try to find peace. Don't go to sleep on me now. So many people try to find peace by finding themselves. The Bible says the fool wants to discover his own heart. There is a charismatic deception that you need to understand. This is very important. You say, why can't some people understand? Here's why. The Bible says the scorner will not go to the wise. And here's the trick. The charismatic has been taught that all thinking and reasoning is bad. So I've met charismatics downtown as we tried to engage them and discuss doctrine with them. And I have seen some begin to understand truth. They begin to say, wow, that makes sense. And they were about to understand and find victory in a lot of things in life. And you know what happened? They felt themselves thinking. And they've been told over and over that if you begin to think, that is the enemy. That is the enemy. Remember, Aleister Crowley said, the mind is the great enemy. And the early Pentecostals, they put shoeboxes over their head. They said, i got to escape my mind. i got to escape my mind. And then they started barking like dogs and oinking like pigs and going crazy. I'm telling you, that is demonic. It is demonic. So the point here that I'm trying to make is this. If you try to help them, the devil's smarter than that. He knows sooner or later they're going to meet somebody that tries to help them. So he sets them up. The devil said, now somebody's going to come to you but they're going to be evil. If you ever feel yourself thinking, that's them trying to brainwash you. And I've seen these charismatics grab their head and say, no, no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, this has to be the devil, this has to be the devil, and then they flee away. And you just shake your head and think, wow, they were almost using their mind. But they're so afraid of being... Well, what does the JW so-called do, the Watchtower Organization? They say... The evil servant is out there. Do not listen to anything the evil servant says. They're going to come to try to tell you we're a, we're a cult. Do not read their literature. Don't listen to anything they say. Now listen, I understand that there's a time for separation. I preach separation. And I understand that evil people can deceive you. But they take it to such a degree that they never even hear the other side, you understand. They're afraid of hearing the other side, no matter how mature they are, no matter how old they are, how long they've been a watchtower convert, they, they still won't read. I said, these are your documents. I mean, I would sit in my apartment years ago uh, uh, and, and I would give them, their, this is a watchtower. No, I can't read it. I can't read it. You can't read your own magazine? That's so sad. So, You know, people say, don't listen to that preacher. Don't listen to Joey now. Brother Joe, no, 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 no. He'll brainwash you. He'll brainwash you. Don't don't listen to him. Don't go to him. Whatever you do, don't go to him and bring your objection. See, somebody set you up. Somebody set you up. See, somebody set you up so you can remain, so you can remain brainwashed. The deceiver wants to set you up so you can never hear truth. So what is it that I need to hear? Let me show you right now. The words depart from evil and do good come first. In Psalms 34, it says, What man is he that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Then it says, Seek peace. Seek peace comes after. 
Depart from evil and do good. James tells us the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. What happens if we get that backwards? What if we say the wisdom from above is first peaceable, then pure? Well, we got a problem, don't we, Brother Caleb? We got a problem. People say, well, I'm just to seek peace at all costs. Paul says, if it be possible, if it be possible, be at peace with all men. But we don't make peace the number one priority because that's not possible all the time. Isaiah 48, Oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river. There's no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Have you got that straight? Young people, if you don't get anything straight today, anybody listening to me today, if you don't get anything straight, get this straight right here. There is no peace to the wicked. You cannot have peace and be wicked. You cannot have peace. God says, oh, that thou had hearkened to my commandments. You cannot break the Lord's commandments and expect to have peace. You cannot disobey your father. You cannot disobey your husband. You cannot commit adultery. You cannot get drunk. You cannot watch worldly wicked things. You cannot be immodest. And all of the, you, you cannot do all of these things and expect to have peace. If you find peace, God's a liar. If you find, and God's not a liar. That's the one thing God can't do. God says, the Bible says he cannot lie. God's not mocked. You're not going to find peace. God's not a liar. God says, I would have given you peace. But peace comes through his commandments. This is why we title the message, Feminism Makes Women Sad. How in the world can disobeying God's commandments make women happy? It can't, because God can't lie. It says in Isaiah 59, the way of peace they know not. There's a way of peace. You can't have peace, sister, unless you walk the way of peace. There's a way of peace. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. If you follow the crooked path, if you follow somebody that says you can get off the road, we're not a legalist, you can come over here and we can take a shortcut. Come on, you can go the shortcut. It's okay, don't listen to these people. Don't even go talk to them about this. Don't, just come over with me to the shortcut. See, aren't we having a good time? Isn't this great? No, you're off the road. You're off the way of peace. You're off the road that God has prepared for you to walk in. No, no, you can't have peace. You're a liar. Jeremiah 23, I quote it quite often. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of the evildoers that none return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. But this is what I want you to see today. Verse 17, they say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, you shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. God says they strengthen the hands of evildoers. How do they do it? There's people that are despising God's truth. They will not endure sound doctrine. They're despising God's commandments. And you know what these people say? They say, you shall have peace. It'll be okay at the judgment seat of Christ for you. It's the old man that gets punished at the judgment seat. God doesn't care about all these other things. God looks upon the heart, and they'll whisper when they say heart, you know. When they say the word spirit, they're going to whisper and get all breathy like the music they listen to. And, and it seems so religious and holy. And I've seen them get up here and sing over the years and get all breathy and, and emotional and then go out and commit adultery. I'm telling you, don't you fall for it. Don't you fall for all of that plastic mess. I believe it's good to get emotional with God, but don't you fall for that false spirituality. 
They say unto them that despise me, the Lord, well, getting hot in here, isn't it? I say, they say unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, you shall have peace. Who are you giving peace to? Who are you telling will have peace? Who are you making feel? Oh, I've seen it. I have seen it. I've read it with my own eyes. I have read the backsliders say, well, so many people are encouraging me. So many people are giving me peace and promising me peace. I'm not going to repent. As the prodigal said, I'm not going to go back home. No, no. We better get straight. There will be some division. Luke chapter 21, suppose ye that I'm come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. I think throughout history fundamentalism has maybe not preached the fullness of these verses. I believe maybe to some degree we have erred by promising everybody that if you just do A, B, C, you'll never have any trouble in your home. According to the Lord Jesus, if you do A, B, and C, you probably will have some trouble in your home unless you've got a lot of grace and God has just been a great blessing to you. See, there's going to be division. There's going to be division. I wish there was no division. None of us want division. But you need to understand. It's not absolute. John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. The world will give peace. The world will pat you on the back and say, peace, peace. Let's party. I'm just feeling so bad. This is so, no, no, don't worry. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. Let's just get drunk. Yeah, the world will give you peace, but it's a peace that leaves you more and more empty. It's a peace that takes you further and further down to hell. And there's going to a, a time is coming when everything is going to reach the final culmination of the Antichrist before God's final judgment in Armageddon. And the whole world is going to say peace and safety and the Antichrist is going to destroy many by peace. Then the Bible says, sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They're going to bring in this final kingdom of man without God, with a fake, counterfeit religion. And the Bible says, sudden destruction shall come upon them. This will be true, and it will occur worldwide. And it occurs daily with individuals today. When they say peace and safety, sometimes we see the sudden destruction come upon them. But here's what I want you to realize. Listen to me good. Listen to me good, children. Wake up. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Listen to me. There is a slow destruction. There is a slow destruction. And when you say peace and safety... God does not always hit you immediately with a sudden destruction. It's coming. But sometimes there is a slow destruction that is eating away everything that is good and happy and healthy in your life. Now we're going to get into some of the point. Headline, Drudge Report, George Michael killed self after four failed attempts. When I was a young man, George Michael was a sodomite that was a pop music singer. He ended up being on MTV and everywhere and having all these hit songs. He was a sodomite. Why was he trying to kill himself? I thought the way that they're walking is supposed to make them happy. So you could be famous and have money and go your own way. Isn't he following his own heart? Why is he trying to kill himself? 
Like you better ask yourself that. Before you believe what they say about the broad way, you better ask yourself, why is he trying to kill himself? Why are all these sodomites trying to kill themselves? They say it's because Christians teaching the Word of God. No. It's because they've gone the way of Cain. They've gone their own way. And they're against God. And they're against God. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no peace to the wicked, saith God. They don't have peace. And when they kill themselves, they're not going to have peace. What about all these rock and roll pop stars? I grew up with, with, with Boston, this happy rock band, singing everywhere. Why did he kill himself? Why did the singer of Nirvana kill himself? Why do all these people kill themselves? Doesn't rebellion make you happy? Why are the homosexuals and pop stars and rock stars and all of these people killing themselves? There is no peace to the wicked. That's why. What about the godless comedians? What about Robin Williams? I preach sermons on these people. Why is it that all of these people end up killing themselves? Happy, happy, joke, joke. Sin's just a mock. Sin, sin, sin. Let's just mock it. Let's blaspheme God. It's all funny, isn't it? Everybody laughs. Then they go kill themselves. Folks, shouldn't you stand back from that and say... I don't think you've chosen the right way. I, I think you went the wrong way. Let's speak of feminist for a second. Go take a look at Betty Friedan. Go see what she looked like. And let me ask a question that you ought to ask yourself. Maybe you're a young person, a young teenage girl maybe in your early 20s or teens. And that feminism is appealing to you. Why don't you look at the people who have already been there and done that when they were your age? <laughs> Why don't you look at the people that are in their 70s now and hear what they say? I preach sermon after sermon quoting them, warning young women, don't do what we did you're not going to find happiness. They're not Christians. They're not fundamentalists. They're just aging feminists that say we were lied to. Shouldn't you stop and say, wait a second. If the people that have already been on the train, <laughs> they don't look happy, and they're telling me, don't ever get on the train. It'll ruin your life. Maybe I ought to not lean to my own understanding. Maybe I ought to think about some of these things. What does God's Word say? What does God's Word say? Notice Jeremiah 6. This jumped out at me. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know what that's saying? It's figurative for Israel as the daughter of of his people for Jerusalem, but let's look at it in a more literal sense. God is saying they're healing women by lies. And they're telling young women that when they go the way that is not in the Bible, mock it as old-fashioned, mock it as the old paths, and say, I'm taking the broad way. I'm not going to go that narrow way. I'm going to take the broad way, and, and, and I'm going to find healing and happiness and blessing. No. God says they're not really healing them. They're not really blessing them. They're cursing them with their lies. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. You're not going to find any peace that way. Ask the aging feminist. So God goes on and says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Oh, they were haughty. They were haughty women. Oh, I tell you, 
They're not afraid of abominations. They're not afraid of dressing like men, which God said is an abomination. Whoever does this is an abomination. They're not afraid of leaving their homes and leaving their roles. They're not afraid of, of fornication. They're not afraid of adultery. That's liberation. They're not afraid of killing little babies. That's liberation. They're not even blushing. As Jezebel, she just covers it up. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Oh, that's going to be the rapture, the tribulation period, and finally the judgment seat of Christ. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see. And ask for the old past. God says, you know what? We could fix this right now. You've got two ways before you. You've got the traditional Bible way. And you've got this modern new experiment. The feminist way. Stand in the ways. Stand. Look at them, says God. Look at them both. Look at them both. And ask for the old past. God says, here's how you do it. Ask for the old past. Just go around and say, you know what? They stayed married in earlier days. People right now that are 80 and 84, they stay married. They're with their grandchildren. They, they've seen their children grow up and some of their grandchildren. That, why did that work? Go to them. I have. How did you stay married? They said divorce isn't an option. You get through your hard times. And they say, I thank God it wasn't an option. <laughs> and, and, and you're able to just get through these things. And it blesses your children and blesses your grandchildren. Ask for the old past. Look in the Bible. God, how are you telling people to live? What do you want a woman to be? What do you want a mother to be? What do you want a wife and a husband and a child to be? Walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. God promises you peace. God promises you rest. But he says these liars out here are saying you can walk in the new way and still find rest and peace. You're a liar. It's not going to happen. God cannot lie. He says if you walk in these old paths, you will find rest. If you do it with the right attitude, for the right reasons. Now anybody can take a pig and put a jewel in its nose that doesn't really want to follow, and it can go around grudgingly and not be a cheerful giver and not serve God with gladness and huff and puff and be all mad about the standards and just rebel, rebel, gripe, 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 and say, see, I was never happy. Well, why don't you try serving God like that woman did who was forgiven of her sins and fell down because she knew she was a sinner and has been forgiven, and Jesus says those that have uh, been forgiven much will love much. She fell down at the Lord's feet and wiped His feet with her long hair and with her tears and she served God cheerfully well you come along with your haughty attitude and no wonder you don't find any peace serving God like that why don't you surrender why don't you surrender to God and his way and quit your haughtiness oh, but God predicts that they're not going to do it isn't that sad I got to preach this sermon anyway maybe I'll get somebody but God predicts they're not going to do it. He says, they said, we will not walk therein. We are not going to walk in the old way. We are not going to walk in the old path. We're going to find rest and peace by going our own way, and you're going to be sorry. You just wait and see. I'm going to go this broad way, and you're going to see. God says again, I will set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. The trumpet warns you, beware, beware. But they said, we will not hearken. We're not going to listen to that preacher. I'm not going to listen to my daddy. I'm not going to listen to the pastor. I'm not going to listen to the, the, these older wise women that have been there, done that, and are warning me. No, I'm not going to listen to the Miss Debras of the world. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm going to listen to all of these that have ruined their own marriages, ruined their own lives, and are not happy people. God help us. Why were they not ashamed at their abominations? Because they felt justified. 
There's a victim mentality that's being sold to everybody today. They tell people, that they tell the black man, you are in poverty. You can't get ahead today. You have to live like a thug and, and, and live the way you're living because you just can't, you can't do anything else. That's wicked teaching. And praise God for the good black men that are out there on YouTube and everywhere trying to lift a person out of that victim mentality so they can make something of their lives and not fall into that wicked victim thinking. The feminist, no matter what they do, they feel justified because men are so toxic. Men did this to us. Whatever experiences I'm feeling, the homosexuals, a victim mentality. It's these Christians that don't like homosexuality. That's why I'm not happy. Everybody says, how about why don't you obey God and see if you'll be happy? Is that so hard? You do got to give up your pride and your covering. What about all those people in the Depression? They were poor, brother. But black families stayed together. People stayed together, but they were poor. It wasn't poverty that makes you wicked and act wicked and unlawful and all of that. There's all kinds of holy people that are poor. It's somebody lying to you out there to use you so they can manipulate you for votes. Psalms 119, I will walk at liberty, for I went the broad way. No, I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. And when you go the old way, when you listen to what God says, you will find liberty and peace and rest, says God. Rest for your souls. Look at this, Psalms 119. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That doesn't mean nothing shall bother them. What it means is they're not going to stumble. They're not going to stumble. They're not going to trip. But these other people, they're going to trip. They're going to fall into all kinds of abominations. And they're not going to have great peace because they think God's law is a strange thing. You say, wait a minute, hold on a second. Let, let's just read right here in the Bible. The Bible said in the last days they will not endure sound doctrine. Look over here in Titus chapter 2. It says, speak the things which become sound doctrine. Let's read what sound doctrine is and we'll find out what they're not going to endure in the last days. The aged women that you teach the younger women to love their husbands, to be good, chaste, keepers at home, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Woo! That's sound doctrine. Why don't we just start there? Why don't we obey that? That's strange. That's wrong. Well, if you count the Word of God, you're not going to have peace. If you count the Word of God a strange thing, you will not have peace. You will not find rest for your soul. Well, that's what they did back in the olden days. They, they weren't happy then. How do you know? Because I saw a Hollywood movie, and it showed me people from that age, and they, they weren't happy. Don't, I've got books on my bookshelf from the 1600s. Don't you tell me what people believed back then. You go prove to me that, that everybody was miserable. You don't know what you're talking about. But listen to me now. For the, for the last part of this sermon, I wish we would have got here sooner because some people probably done turned it off by now and if I would have started here, they might have kept listening. They don't like the preaching. But listen to me now. Listen. If you give this to somebody, forward it to like the second half of the message. Now listen to me. I'm not going to quote fundamentalists. I'm going to quote liberal, Trump-hating, Jezebel newspapers. Because see, you won't hear the Word of God, many people. You won't listen to history. You won't even hear the aging feminist. So... Let's listen to the Jezebel newspapers. Let's see what they say. Here's Slate. Slate Magazine, 2006. They have down at the bottom, we've been holding Trump to account all year. Help us keep going. Please give us some money. Be a member. So are these, these people like Trump? 
No, these, these are liberals. This is Slate Magazine. All right, so, so now you can listen, see. These are the liberals. So everybody sit up and get connected. Now you can listen. Let's see what they say. Desperate feminist wives. Why wanting equality makes women unhappy. In the feminine mystique, the late Betty Friedan attributed the unhappiness of married women largely to traditionalist marriages. Her book helped spark the sexual revolution of the 1970s. But last week, two sociologists at the University of Virginia published an exhaustive study of marital happiness among women that challenges this assumption. Stay-at-home wives, according to the authors, are more content than their working counterparts. Woo! Amen! Fundamentalists didn't say that. Sociologists in Slate magazine, they said it. Uh, we're sorry, but the stay-at-homes are more happier than you career women. Wow. The most interesting data may be that the women who strongly identify as progressive, the 15% who agree most with feminist ideals, have a harder time being happy than their peers. <laughs> Wait a minute. Stop. Stop. The progressive-minded women look over at these other ones and say, no, you're just old-fashioned. You're being brainwashed. According to the studies, the more progressive you are as a woman, the more unhappy you are. Wow. Am, am I preaching from Isaac Macy Haldeman in 1918 on his Sunday night sermon, Beware of the Jezebel Feminism? No! This is from sociologists in Slate magazine. Feminist ideals, not domestic duties, seem to be what make wives morose. Wow. Progressive married women who should be enjoying some or all of the fruits that Friedan lobbied for are less happy, it would appear, than women who live as if Friedan never existed. The difference in happiness persists even among working wives. They were even less happy than their peers about being a primary breadwinner. So... You said, okay, hold on a second. If they were staying at home, but if they were able to go out and work and share in the income, they'd be happy. No, the ones that went and shared in the income were less happy than the ones that didn't share in the income. You say, well, hold on a second. That's only because they weren't making as much as a man. Hey, I got an idea. Let them go out and make more than their husbands and be the primary breadwinner in the home. Then they'll be happy. No. They found out that the ones who made the most money, even more than their husbands, were even more less happy. Pardon my English. The authors also found that equal division of labor in the home seems not to correlate strongly with happiness. So you say, well, if those men would help them at home, then they'd be happy. <laughs> no, no. Uh, they checked it all. They checked it all. No, no. It's being a feminist makes you unhappy. Wow. Traditionalist women, a significant portion of whom are Christian, expect less emotional work from their husbands, which makes it easier for them to shake off frustrations. We do know that traditional marriages have the advantage of offering clearly defined roles. So these these sociologists said there's something about these Christian. The more traditionalist they are, the more happy they are. And, and, and they're trying to figure it out. Maybe it's because their expectations are not as high. Maybe because they say, oh, he's just a man. I don't expect him to, uh, to do what all these feminists expect. They, they're trying to figure it out. They even say maybe it's the clearly defined role. You know when you give a kid boundaries, they know what's wrong and right, and we got a clearly defined role of what I'm called to be? It makes happiness in the child. Well, the same is probably true with women. When you know what God says you ought to be, then you can join with women and, and rejoice in what God made you to be, and you're happy. Wow! Hey, let's not stop, stop there. Let, let's move on three more years. The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness. This is from the National Bureau of Fundamentalist Research, May 2009. No! This is from the National Bureau of Economic Research, 
uh, uh, Betsy, and, Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers, May 2009. This, they started in the 19, late 60s and 70s. Wake up, boys. Uh, they, they started in the late 60s and 70s. They went through every survey they could find for decade after decade after decade until 1909. They looked at every study out there. Here was their conclusion. Women's happiness has declined both absolutely and relative to men. The paradox of women's declining relative well-being is found across various data sets, measures of subjective well-being, and is pervasive across demographic groups and industrialized countries. That means no matter what country we went to, women are growing less happy. Divorce rates doubled between the mid-1960s and mid-70s. The stock of divorced people has continued to grow. There has been an increase in the rate of children born out of wedlock. Real wages of many men fell during much of this period. Women have traditionally reported higher levels of happiness than men. They're saying before the feminist movement, women always were more happier than men. But all of a sudden, once the feminist movement kicked in, now it's reversed. Women are less happy. Both women who are employed and those who are not have experienced roughly, roughly similar declines in subjective well-being. The changes brought about through the women's movement may have decreased women's happiness. Wow. That's heavy for a secular person to say, isn't it? What they're saying is, folks, I don't care what you think about it, something's wrong. Something's wrong. From the late 60s to 70s all the way up, th they showed a graph. And it started out with women's happiness right here. The graph goes down every decade. I mean, it's a perfect incline all the way down. What's happening? What's happening? The more progressive and feminist women become, the less happiness. Now, what did God say? He said, walk in the old paths. The daughter of my people, don't let anybody heal you through all these lies. Walk in the old paths and you'll find rest. Are these women finding rest, brother? No, they're not finding rest at all. Because God's not a liar. My God's not a liar. If you can find rest going the feminist way, it's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. The Huffington Post, one of the most liberal magazines, uh, newspapers, 2009, this finding is neither unique to this one study, nor is it unique to the United States. They admitted it. They said something is wrong with women. Albert Moeller, who is a Baptist, 2009, says the women's movement wasn't about happiness. That judgment attributed to feminist Susan Faludi. In other words, this wasn't the Baptist Albert Moeller, so Peck, saying the women's movement wasn't about happiness. It was feminist Susan Saluti. She said the women's movement wasn't about happiness. Then Time Magazine's current cover story, The State of the American Woman. As the cover of the magazine explains, a new poll shows why they are more powerful but less happy. Oh, man. Hey, let's go back to somebody that was fighting the feminist movement back then, okay? Phyllis Schlafly. She is a Catholic, but boy, does she understand a lot of this. I think she's dead now, but boy, does she understand a lot. Uh, here's NPR interview in 2011. Phyllis Schlafly, uh, Phyllis Schlafly explains why feminism has made women unhappy. So she's going to tell you the reason. One of her biggest achievements was her campaign to stop the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment in the early 1970s. She says, a lot of people don't understand what feminism is. It is about power for the female left. They have this, I think, ridiculous idea that American women are oppressed by the patriarchy. They're really in fight, in a fight with human nature. Hey, folks, you try to fight against human nature, you're not going to win. You try to go against nature, you're not going to win. See, really, I would put in here they're in a fight with God. If you go to one of the first feminists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she tried to tell all the other feminists, listen, it's the God of the Bible. You must get rid of that Bible. It's the Bible that must be our enemy. 
Yeah, they're in a fight with human nature, but they're in a fight with God, brother, and you're not going to win that battle. The interviewer says, do you feel that feminism has made any contribution to American life? She says, no. I think it's made women unhappy. Some of the women say they don't want to take care of their own babies. I don't know why a man would marry a woman like that. I tell the college kids they ought to find out if the girl they're dating is a feminist or not. Don't be taken in by feminism. You young fellows, just because she's pretty, when you start getting older and, and uh, ready to start looking for somebody to marry, you better find out what, whether she's obedient to her dad, and you better find out what she thinks about feminism. You better find that out before you marry them. Because you get home, she don't obey her dad. She's not going to obey you. And she's going to rule that roost. Unless you just want to live like that the rest of your life, you're going to have trouble. Psychology Today, boy, that's a fundamentalist journal, isn't it? 2011, let's go up a few years. Meet the least happy people in America. What are the unhappiest people? Females at 42 years old, unmarried, and no children. In a professional position, a doctor or a lawyer. What? What? The ones that got the best jobs are the unhappiest? Boy, I've seen some of them. Man, I tell you what, they don't look too happy to me, brother. I tell you what, most people say, I think they're off their meds. That's what everybody says around them behind their back, even their friends. I, I've heard their, 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 their affiliates and people that, I've heard them say, I think she's off her meds, you know. I didn't say that. I don't like all those meds. But I'm just telling you what people think about people like that. They're not happy folks. As Christian Hassler writes in The Myth of Having It All, somewhere along the path of the women's liberation movement, we began to buy into the belief that to be an empowered woman means we have to do everything that both men and women do. All right, so we got Slate Magazine. We've got Huffington Post. We've got Psychology Today. Uh, here's the New York Post, 2016. Bravo's millionaire matchmaker Patty Sanger, another non-conservative, will tell you that her business is busier than ever with successful women who are alone and desperate to find a partner. <laughs> is this some Christian, this Patty Stanger brother? No. No. She's one of these matchmakers. A lot of feminine-looking women and women in general have assumed the role of a man, and it's driving the real men away. Amen to that. This is what she's telling them. She's like, well, why, why doesn't anybody like me? I've got all this money and everything. And, and so she's trying to whisper in their ear, because you look and act like a man. A real man doesn't want somebody that looks and acts like a man. He wants somebody to open the door for, somebody to protect. And he doesn't want some creature acting like it's a man that's not a man. And that's what you become. If you're a woman, you're a glorious, wonderful, created being. But when you're trying to be something you're not, that's a monstrosity. It's like a man being effeminate. That's a monstrosity. That's, that's a perversion. So she's trying to tell them. Women have eclipsed men in business and earning power and feel that it's time for them to be treated like a man. The problem is that it's not satisfying. So she's saying, women, go out there and do it. Has it made you happy? Has it made you happy making all that money and showing men, I'm going to be a man. You're going to treat me like a man. No, it's made you lonely and miserable. Ultimately, they don't like how it feels. So they complain about the dynamic that they help create. Here's Market Watch, 2016. I'm a 40-year-old woman with a great career in my own home. So why am I so unhappy? I spent the first part of my life in the rat race striving for what I don't know. Here's NPR. Boy, they are not liberal. I I'm sorry, uh, uh, anti-liberal. Suicide rates climb in U.S., especially among adolescent girls. CNN. U.S. suicide rates up, especially for women. NPR, 2017. U.S. suicide rates are rising faster among women than men. Here's The Guardian, 2017, from the U.K., a new NHS survey shows women to be unhappier than men for almost their entire lives until their mid-80s. So, you want to go this feminist way? According to the data, maybe somewhere around 87 years old, 
you'll start getting a little bit of peace. I don't know why. Maybe because you start repenting and opening up your eyes. Women are unhappiness, unhappiest in the middle years, with 24% age between 45 and 54 classified as mentally ill. Wow. Camille Paglia, Paglia, I don't know how to pronounce her name. She's been, uh, we don't agree with everything this, this woman says, but she's shocking the world as she comes out and, and begins to say, I notice wherever I go in the world that upper middle class career women are very unhappy. Feminists have to stop blaming men for their own unhappiness. For thousands of years, women had their own world. This is a brand new experiment, this feminism. They're working side by side with men in the workplace. Stop blaming men. She says, you're, 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 you're unhappy because you're not doing what women have always done around women in women's place with women's work. They used to go wash the clothes. She talks about her, her parents, her mama would go with all the other women and wash the clothes and, and they were happy. They had their world. But now they're in this world competing with men and here she is as this secular uh, person that doesn't know the Lord Jesus that I know of um, would not embrace biblical standards but she's using her own experience and observation and says, you feminists are not happy because you're victim-minded. And you are, are, this is a new experiment. What did you think you're going to find when you go in a new way? That's why God says, meddle not with them that are given to change. And God says, seek for the old paths and walk therein. All right, here's the Daily Wire, 2017. Feminism is leaving a wake of unhappy, unmarried, and childless women in its path. According to a recent study from Yale University researchers, liberated, college-educated women can't find a man to marry and have children with before their natural childbearing years expire. Because of feminism, liberated women are college-educated but unhappy and alone in exchange. Women have been left in sadness and isolation. Feminist women said they would marry a man who doesn't have a degree, but they can't find one who wants to marry them. They're like, I don't even care if he has a degree. Just give me a man. And the men, they get together with the fellas. They said, no, she's a feminist. I took her out. I could tell immediately she's a feminist. You know, we went to dinner. I'm not going to marry her. He'll use her, but he's not going to marry her. The less chaste a woman is, the less preferable she will likely be to a man. Daily Wire, brother? The Daily Wire? The less chaste a woman is? Wow, somebody ought to wake up. Some, some young girl, listen to this sermon, she ought to wake up. She ought to say, I'm done. Don't even say anything else. I repent. Give me the book. Give me my King James Bible. I'm going to follow it fully. And, and you know what? I'm just taking off all this other stuff, all this garbage, all this propaganda from the world. I'm going to be free for the first time, free to be what God made me to be. Oh, I, I pray somebody does that. I pray somebody does. The less chaste a woman is, the less preferable she will likely be to a man. These simple truths will be rejected by feminists everywhere, clinging hard to their sad, lonely lives in exchange for empty feminism as they accuse any dissenter of being against women. Well, you're just against women. <laughs> in other words, the writer of the Daily Wire says, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. You're just going to say they're misogynists, they're against women. Go ahead in your little fantasy. Here's the independent UK magazine. No, no, independent, I'm not sure where that is. 2017, a, a state senator, Chris McDaniel, a Republican of Mississippi, wrote, So a group of unhappy liberal women marched in Washington, D.C. We shouldn't be surprised. Almost all liberal women are unhappy. Before I get misrepresented, if you think I'm against femininity, you got to have your head examined. I'm against feminism. I'm for women. I'm for women being happy. I'm for children being happy. I'm, for, I'm against anything that makes you unhappy. The, the, the parent that is disciplining their children with the truth and with the word and training them, they're not against children. They're for the children's happiness. You see what I mean? When we bring the words of the, of the Lord... We might not like them, but they're for our happiness, see. 
Here's Yahoo 7 News, January 2018. 85% of women are unhappy. Brother, we're almost reaching 100% now. Maybe, maybe it's by the end of the year now. We're almost, how far are we in 2018? 85% of women unhappy. New research gives depressing statistics. 50% have a mental health issue relating to their work. This must have been in Mongolia or Nigeria. No, brother. It says survey was across 83 nations. 85% of women unhappy. There's a fella named Corey who runs a website. I don't believe he's a Christian. And I'm not going to endorse everything he might say. But he did pretty much nail it right here. Let me read it to you as we close. If feminism is so great, why are most feminists so angry and miserable? Spewing hatred for men seems to be the only thing that makes them feel good about their own empty life. Have you noticed, when you go down this road, you're going to be miserable until you have a moment where somebody will listen to you, complain, and prop up your victim mentality. And that will make you feel good for a second. But it's like cocaine. It just leaves you more empty. See, It's never going to make you happy. It's never going to make you happy. Feminism teaches women that femininity is sexist and oppressive. So it's no surprise that many young women today are purposely making themselves look ugly and behave in a disgusting manner just to shock and offend people to get a reaction. They try too hard to act like men. This play acting can only lead to inner suffering as their deviancy corrodes their emotional health. With women today drinking alcohol, doing other drugs, both prescription and illicit, it's no wonder that more and more of them are becoming unstable and crazy. This is also why you have so many adult women acting like spoiled children. Also, they've been conditioned to seek bad boys. That's the new thing now. I'm a feminist, so I like the thugs. I, I want to go after the thug because I'm a feminist. How is dating somebody into rap music pro-women? Yeah, we, we don't like those fundamentalists. We're pro-women, aren't we? Yeah, let's put on the radio. I can't, even, I, I can't even repeat what trash is coming off of it. Treat your woman like a dog, drag her around by the hair. What in the world? Oh, yeah, you're just liberated, little girl. Oh, you're just something that you're attracted to thugs. You're just so liberated. What kind of music's in their car? You've lost your mind. People are saying this all around the country. Now, what's wrong with these girls? What's wrong with, with, with the more progressive they are, the more ignorant they get? You know what? They can't find anybody else. That's probably the reason. See, there are men out there, boys, that will prop up your feminism and tell you what you want to hear to use you. They're the ones at the restaurant that listen to the waitress, and they know that if they got due process and heard the other side, things might change. But no, no, they're going to say, oh, that's terrible. You were mistreated? What happened? Oh, that's just so terrible. And they're not going to get the other side because they are either so ugly they can't get anybody else, or number two, what, probably what's going on is they want to use that girl. So these bad boys, they'll tell you what you want to hear because they're using you. They're using you. Fail, a male feminist and white knights give them unconditional support. You can read their little blog posts and Instagrams and whatever they, they write out there. Oh, I'm just so tempted to go and, and, and just return and, 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 and go back to my former life and some fella from Poland or somebody, oh, and they'll start propping them up and encouraging them, these little male feminists, you know what I mean? What are they doing? They're just using these girls. They're just using them. They're hoping that she'll start a relationship and they could use them, you know. Or they're just losers. And he even says, loser male feminists and white knights constantly defend women no matter what and end up warping the worldview of these said women 
These pathetic men are the enablers of women's worst behaviors. So they're not helping children, and they're not helping the women. If you love somebody, you would say, you know what, sister? Um, I detect some bitterness. Um, I'm not saying you haven't been mistreated, but, but, but can we begin to analyze some of this and, and maybe uh, sort through whether or not you're being rebellious and you've got a bitter heart, see? Here's a headline. Women unhappy, woman with, unhappy with her nails accused of dragging salon employee with her car. Folks, they're not only getting unhappy, man. They're getting, they're getting crazy. You messed up my nails. Drag you down the road. One of the unheard of things around the world that nobody wants to mention is the domestic abuse going on. You say, hey, man, no, I'm talking about a men. J -j just type in some of these things and watch men getting slapped around and just... But you're not allowed to say anything about that, you know. Let me close with one verse, one chapter for you. We close. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good and let him seek peace and ensue it. In context here, what is peace? What is peace? If you can read that peace here is feminism, may God help you. Everything the Holy Ghost has said is the entire opposite of that movement. And Peter ends it by, I want you to find peace. I want you to be happy. Follow the holy women of old and you'll be happy. If you do it with a good attitude, cheerfully, loving the Lord, knowing that whatever sacrifices you have to make, Jesus told Peter, the Lord Jesus told Peter, whatever you've done, whatever sacrifices, I'm going to repay you a hundredfold in this life and in the world to come. So you're getting paid for everything you have to do. Everything you have to sacrifice, you're getting paid for it. Rejoice in that. Get excited about the rewards and blessings. That doesn't mean that you allow... Uh, unlawful or, or wicked behavior, but you do everything you can to be a godly woman and God will bless you. God will bless you and you'll be happy. I hope this has convinced you. I hope the aging feminist, I hope the liberal studies, the sociologist, I hope they've convinced you, but I don't know why I had to quote any of that, brother. Isn't the Word of God enough? Can't we just open the Word of God and have faith in it? I don't understand. Why can't we just read the Word of God? It's the only inspired Word. And I read all of that other stuff to just prove our Bible is perfect. Our Bible is perfect. Trust God. Trust God. And hopefully I never have to do anything like that again. We'll just trust God from now on. Amen? Dear Lord, we thank You for our Holy Bible. Lord, I pray for... Any young women, middle-aged women, older women listening to this sermon, God, that you would give them renewed encouragement. Sometimes the whole world is beating up good women, Lord. Making them feel ashamed or stupid because they just simply believe you, God. Oh, Lord. Let them see today. And Lord, if they're young, and they're just starting on this broad way of feminism. Let them see, God. Let them see. And quickly get back on the straight and narrow way, God. If they've been on this road a while, and they say, I've already blown it in so many ways, God, give them hope that they can have a wonderful ministry the Bible said the aged women, that you teach the younger women to love their husbands, to be keepers at home and good and chaste and obedient to their own husbands, that the Word of God be not blessed. And what, what a wonderful ministry they could have encouraging the young people, Lord, to not go the wicked way. 
So, Father, I do pray, young or old, that you'll bless women today, that some will lay down their rebellious heart, God, that some will lay down their haughtiness, God. We know many feminists, Lord, are created by dads who cheated, Father. They were young, maybe 10 years old, and their dad had a relationship and cheated on their mama, Father. And they've grown up insecure about men and about masculinity. Shame on the men who cheat, Father, and hurt these young girls. And then they grow up and have bitter, hard, rebellious lives and, and sometimes wrongly influence their daughters, God. I do pray for whatever reason somebody has embraced the Jezebel doctrine Please, in the name of the Lord Jesus, let something that I've said, let your word bring true peace and rest to their heart. Save families, save children, save souls, God. In Jesus' holy name,